Jason Joyce, publisher of Isthmus. With me is Judy Davidoff, president and editor of Isthmus. Uh, it is the start of, of November. Tomorrow is the first Thursday of November, which means a brand new issue of Isthmus is hitting the streets. Yes. Uh, very excited about it. Uh, the cover story uh, is written by Ron Seeley. Um, tell us who Ron Seeley is, Judy. Sure. I'm sure Ron Seeley is going to be familiar to many of our readers. Um, he covered science and the environment for the Wisconsin State Journal for decades. I believe he started in the late 70s. Um, and as a result, you know, still has some pretty deep sources in the Department of Natural Resources and all throughout the state. And um, I was really thrilled when uh, Ron reached out and he reached out probably about a year ago um, when we, you know, were uh, in the middle of pausing a print and it really was very unclear what was going to be our future, but we were still trying to get content up. And Ron just emailed and said, um, you know, he had been working on this essay about um, COVID and, um, you know, just how his feelings around it and around, um, you know, um, kind of life and, um, you know, would we be interested in, in publishing that? And so it was really just a gift that came to us and um, we published it and was so thoughtful and people loved it. And, you know, we continued to talk. And then when we returned to print, met, um, and talked about all of these ideas that he had, um, which were great, and a lot were in the area of, um, you know, wildlife management and issues around the DNR. And of course, there's really no issue out there that, um, you know, is more on people's mind than uh, the wolves of Wisconsin. And, um, you know, uh, a wolf hunt that we had last spring that uh, brought lots of headlines. Yeah. Um... He talks in this essay, he spends time with a guy who, I mean, for lack of a better term, sort of speaks to the wolves up there, is so intimate and familiar with where they are and who they are that he actually is out talking to them or howling with them. It actually is a way to track wolves. I mean, it's, you know, one, it's one of the many, many things that I learned from this essay. Um, so yeah, um, he goes out in the wolf, out in the woods, and uh, it's, you try to raise the howls of the wolves. Um, so you emit these um, howls and kind of moan-like sounds. And um, if you get a response, of course, you can, um, you, you know that they're in this area and the packs are in different areas of the state. And, um, you know, depending on the sounds, you know, a pup has a higher pitched um, bark back um, and it truly is a way of, of keeping track of these packs. So yeah, I found that fascinating. Yeah, it really is, um, I think, an exploration of our complicated uh, relationship. I mean, it's it's cast as Wisconsin's complicated relationship with wolves, but really it's, uh, you know, maybe throughout the history of, of humans and wolves living together, yep. it's it's always been a complicated relationship. Yeah. And, and what's wonderful about this essay and Ron's approach is that it really is storytelling. Um, you know, you are in the woods with Ron. You hear about his own you know, thoughts on the wolves over the years, you, but it's also deeply researched, you know, you learn um, that wolves were bound to, you know, we had a bounty system, um, $20 for an adult, $10 for a pup, and, you know, how they were really hunted almost to extinction in the state, and then they, the pack slowly came back when we had, um, you know, protections for them, um, so you learn all of the history, you kind of learn why we're here, how we got here, um, brings a lot of perspective to the hunt um, that we had in the spring, how we got to that point, and who the forces are um, that are, are now, you know, in play, um, forcing these kinds of hunts. Yeah. Uh, also in the news section of the paper uh, this month is... Um, a story by Stephen Potter about uh, the Brittany Zimmerman case, which many people will remember 
um, a young woman who was murdered in downtown Madison uh, in 2008, I think uh, mm -hmm. uh, is right. That's a long case. It's been on, you know, people bring it up from time to time, but that's 13 years that have, have passed, almost uh, almost 14 years that have passed since it happened. Can you tell us about that story and what, uh, what Stephen Potter brings that's new? Sure. Um, so yes, as Jason mentioned, um, you know, there is finally a um, charge in the case, David Call. Um, and what, uh, and yeah, it's been, what, um, 13 years or so, um, you know, the police department says we never gave up, um, you know, trying to solve this murder. Um, there was a lack of witnesses, uh, it seemed. And um, now there's, in the complaint, they're hinging the case on uh, this new DNA analysis. Um, and Stephen does go into detail about how it's different. It's, it's really more based on a mathematical probability than a match with blood. And um, it's, it's a very interesting piece too, because um, you know there are questions about this methodology and the company. Um, is not very transparent with its code. Um, and so there are, there are questions about how reliable it is. And I'm assuming that that will, you know, be part of the case when it moves forward. Yeah. The trial. He, he also checks in with, uh, with Brittany Zimmerman's family. Um, yes. And that's obviously been, yeah, again, you know, she would, have, she would be about 35 years old at this point, which is just these, these victims of crimes, to me, you know, they sort of, you know, she's 22 or 21 in all of our minds, because that's how old she was when she was murdered. But she, yeah, she would have been 35 now. It's, yeah, it's no, I mean, and Steve, yeah, thankfully covers all of that, too. And just how heartbreaking, you know, the mom talks about going to a wedding of another relative and, you know, just it's, you know, hitting home every time about what what's missed and um, the ongoing hurt. Yeah. yeah. Well, moving into the feature section of the paper, um, we have uh, we have a number of stories. We we have booze news this month. <laughs> uh, a number of stories about about alcoholic, uh, you know, news in the in the business of producing alcoholic beverages in our community. Mm -hmm. But maybe the the coolest, well, the 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 lead story sort of of that feature section is about a brewery making non-alcoholic beer. Uh, what's that all about? Well, first of all, uh, kudos to Linda Falkenstein for the headline, which is the buzz on no buzz. Right. <laughs> I thought it was really good. Yeah, um, yeah it's, um, you know, a story by Robin, Robin Shepard, who does a lot of our beer coverage um, about Octopi and their um, just increasing production on non-alcoholic beers, which I do think is great. Um, you know, I think it gives the ability of people to go out and, you know, drink uh, if they want or have something non-alcohol if they want and still be able to, you know, participate in the social gathering, you know, if that's what they want to do or, or have it, of course, at home. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, I know that there was one, um, just looking at the story and, uh, yeah, they say it could be, Octopi says it could be 20 to 25% of their total beer production next year, which For seems sure. like a pretty quick ramp up. Um, I went to, um, I went to Brewers games this summer with a friend who, um, had given, has basically given up drinking, uh, stopped drinking during the pandemic and has just continued mm -hmm. in that vein. And um, he ordered, uh, he was drinking Heineken Zeros uh, at the game. And that was, he was sort of a curiosity of everyone around us. Mm -hmm. like, hmm, is that any good? What's it like? Uh, I think a lot of people are interested in how this non-alcoholic beer tastes and whether it's something they can, you know, sort of wrap. Right. And this, you know, here it's moving in the craft beer area. So right. that's what's exciting, you know, I think for us and would be exciting for our readers. Um, you know, not, not the mass production. Yeah. Now you turned your uh, repertorial skills uh, uh, into this area uh, for the issue. You want to talk about your, your uh, contribution? Sure. Um, so I did a little piece on canned cocktails that Steve Liquor um, are making. They're only making them at their university store. Um, but yeah, they're these uh, large crowlers, 32 ounces. And um, my wife first discovered them because she's usually the liquor buyer um, <laughs> and brought a few home. And um, 
I thought they were delicious. You know, we've had an aviation hurricane, uh, Bloody Mary, um, and I um, had actually given one away, I don't remember, uh, on some visit to someone, and it was an aviation. And I thought, oh, I should, you know, restock on that. And so I went in the store and found that, but I didn't find my favorite. And um, and uh, I was soon approached, and um, in the next few minutes, uh, they were whipping up a, a fresh batch of a hurricane and a crowler for me. And so yeah. I ended up uh, talking to him and um, taking a little video and some photos. And, um, you know, it's fascinating. They weigh the ingredients out on a little scale. Um, they sell all the ingredients in the store. So if you like what you drink, you can make it yourself at home. And, um, you know, it's, I, I think most of them are about 20 bucks and there are about six to eight drinks in each one. And the other thing that I found that was really great is, you know, I mean, if you're two people, you're not going to necessarily get through that whole thing and it stays really well in the refrigerator. It's, um, it's mostly up to the fruit juice that's in it, but I mean, we've kept it for a week in a, another container and it's been great. Um, yeah. So yeah, that was my contribution to liquor news this week. <laughs> well, I, you know, it's, it's funny because it's just a little peek in, but you know, behind the scenes, people often ask, well, how do you find, you know, how do you discover the stories you're going to write about? And sometimes it really is as straightforward as seeing something happen in front of you and sort of being curious about it, right? And just Absolutely. asking questions. Absolutely. I mean, the curiosity thing is always, you know, when, when younger journalists, you know, ask about, you know, going into the area or what, and I always say that curiosity is one of the major pieces you need, because that is how you're going to get your stories. Very true. And if you, if you are a reporter, you can often ask anybody anything and they'll actually tell you, which is great perk <laughs> of the job. Uh, yeah. In issues of how we do our job, uh, we we are entering uh, into this week. We started um, a year-end fundraising drive, um, and it is associated with a with sort of a nationwide uh, effort to fund nonprofit journalism uh, called Newsmatch. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, uh, you know, when we, um, I mean, in the very early stages when uh, we were transitioning to a nonprofit, um, most people uh, I talked to said, oh, and you really need to look into the Institute for Nonprofit News. Um, they're kind of the trade group for, for this group. And um, we did. And, and thankfully, we um, got in and that among other things, made us eligible for their annual fundraiser, which is called Newsmatch. And uh, what INN does is they fundraise um, around the country, even internationally, and then end up with a pot of money that they um, distribute among their members. And so this year, um, most, most member organizations got $10,000 um, to match. And so that means that they will, if we raise $10,000, they will match dollar for dollar against that. But we also went to some of the community leaders um, we've been working with who've been also helping fundraise. And um, altogether, we have another $7,500 from them. And so, you know, it's pretty, um, pretty decent amount of money for uh, our uh, end of year fundraising campaign. And um, the first emails went out, I know, uh, earlier this week uh, on our email list. We um, have an um, ad in the paper. If people are check writers, um, they can actually uh, tear off this coupon and just put it in an envelope and mail it to us with their check. Um, I, write, I write a little bit um, in my column this week about it. And of course, we're always available to answer any particular questions about it. Um, but it really is a, um, it's a, uh, people, people I've been told like a match, you know, they right. like to know that their money is going to be doubled, which of course, who wouldn't? Um, so we are hoping that it provides some good incentive for uh, people to help support us. Yeah. You know, when we when we were um, last sort of engaged in an initiative like this to, to raise money, 
uh, it, it was before our August issue had hit the streets. And I think that a lot of people were, well, people who were cautious about giving thought, well, you know, what is this going to be anymore? What am I, what am I going to be actually supporting uh, with my dollars? Um, and are they, are they really in the, like, is this actually going to happen? And of course, uh, tomorrow we'll be distributing our fourth monthly issue since the reboot. Mm -hmm. uh, we're back out. Um, you know, we're, we're doing what we believe is um, journalism that's just as vital as it's ever been, um, albeit a little less frequently um, just due to staffing and, and resources at this point. But yeah. we know that um, people love to see the paperback. Um, yeah. and, you know, and a lot of nonprofit um, journalism organizations which do fantastic work are um, maybe a little nichier, a little bit more focused mm -hmm. than we are. We are still producing <clears throat> a package, a product right. that we've been told people like. And it's this mix of just what yep. we talk about every month. It's, you know, some in-depth news, um, often investigative journalism uh, features, um, which encapsulate, um, you know, how we live our lives in Madison, but also get into the business and economy of our city. Um, and then, of course, arts coverage, um, right. you know, telling people what's going on each week, recommending things, and really trying to connect that community uh, with, with people producing art in our in our area. Um, yep. And so we're doing it. It's four, it's yeah. four issues in, we're, we're doing it again in December. Absolutely. And I really am excited about this issue. I really believe it is the kind of issue where people will sit down, you know, with a cup of coffee, some tea, and, and they will discover things that they didn't know, you know, were out there, um, you know, in terms of the arts, the news, um, you know, the update on the Britney Zimmerman, um, you know, I just, again, I, I've been thinking about kind of this idea of storytelling and, um, you know, it's, it should, I think I've always thought that it, things should be easy to read, you know, a pleasure in the best, you know, of worlds. Um, but it shouldn't just be reading because you have to read, you're making yourself read. Um, and I, I hope that we deliver um, the kind of product that invites you in and, and makes you want to read and um, learn in the process, but it's not a chore. Right. Uh, well, we don't, we have not received any questions today, um, but we invite anyone who sees this at any point in the future, if you have questions for us, please leave them in the comments here and we'll get to them. Uh, we're going to be doing a few more, uh, you know, virtual events here on our Facebook page, including one coming up on uh, Monday, November yep. 8th, 7 p.m., when uh, you and Ron will, will talk about his cover story. Yeah, and I'm really excited about that um, because, again, he knows these issues so deeply and um, is so connected um, also to the world of storytelling um, yeah. that I think he will have lots of things to share. Yeah, I agree. I'm always interested in talking to some of these journalists who have who've retired from the from the day to day uh -huh. grind. Um, but now have this perspective and they sort of look back and say, boy, these are the stories I really want to tell. I really have this burning desire to get this on the page. And I think that that's, that's true. of uh, the And the license to tell it in the way that really resonates both with you and you think will resonate with readers as well. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. Well, Judy, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And thanks to everyone for tuning in and uh, we will see you out, out on the streets on Thursday when we're distributing the paper. That's right. Bye, everybody. Bye.